thanks so much. Um, so I mean, this, that introduction with This American Life, I think, is a really a great way to sort of begin my talk because Paul did a great job in his book of just illustrating how, in, a, in many ways, this is a really kind of amazing moment where people who've been working on the problem, how do you actually get kids to be successful, and they've been working in really diverse fields in neuroscience and you know, in economics and psychology and education and after school. And what we're seeing is that people are actually coming to the same conclusion, um, that there's, there's a lot more to success than just being smart. And what's really even more exciting is the fact that we're all here today and that the people from all these different d diverse fields are actually finally working together. They're talking to each other and these different pieces of work are coming together. Um, so I'm gonna actually talk to you today about, a little bit about how I came um, to be really starting to think about non-cognitive factors um, and give you a little bit of my, my journey um, to this point, and then I'll talk to you about like how we're bringing this um, field together. So I come from education, and I kind of feel like um, in a lot of ways we're a little bit late to the party. I come and I talk to all the after school people, and they're kind of like, where have you been? We've been thinking about this for a really, really long time. But you know, slow to the game, but I think you know, it's really important that we're all starting to work on this problem together. Um, so as mentioned in the, in the introduction, you know, I've been working on this problem of college access and college success for about the past eight or nine years or so. And with what goes on there is the fact, you know, we've, we've actually gotten a lot better at getting kids to go to college. Um, but the problem is that we're actually not seeing more kids actually graduate with a degree. So, you know, one of the questions that we've been thinking a lot about is, you know, what's going on here, right? How do we actually get more kids to succeed, particularly from disadvantaged communities? So um, this is another kind of running theme today, right? You know, a lot of education right now is thinking really, like so much focus on tests. How do we actually get kids to be higher? And that's kind of how we've defined college readiness in a lot of ways. You know, ACT is really trying to push the idea that college readiness is a particular score on their exam. Um, but, you know, what we're finding is that test scores, they do help you get into college, basically because college admissions officers will look at that, um, but they're actually not going to help kids succeed in college. And, you know, a lot of this work actually parallels what Jim Heckman found around the GED. You know, the GED, it's a measure of cognitive ability, um, but it's not the same thing as actually getting through high school. And when we care about what matters in the long run, there's a lot more to it. Um, so I'm just going to illustrate this through um, a book that came out a couple of years ago by Bill Bowen, Matt Chingos, and, um, and Mike McPherson. Um, so where they, in one of their chapters, they were trying to figure out um, what actually, like, what predicts whether or not kids um, from North Carolina State Colleges are actually going to get a degree within six years. So they looked at SAT scores, which seems like the logical place to start. And Controlling for um, grades and demographics, it actually doesn't matter a whole lot about what your SAT score is. You know, if you have between 800 and 890, you're at 49 percent. If you have over 1,100, it's 51 percent. This is really, really surprising. Um, but on the other hand, how you actually did in your classes, your high school GPA actually matters a great deal. So we started to think like, okay, there's something going on here. This is something that's been reflected um, on the work that I've been doing at the Consortium on Chicago School Research, um, and it's what a lot of other people have found. So, um, so what are you getting from test scores? It's cognitive ability, right? It's what do kids have content knowledge and do they have academic skills to succeed? Um, you know, and we also get this from grades, but then there's something else that we actually can learn from how kids have done in their classes that you don't get from test scores, um, which is namely non-cognitive factors. You know, and this finding is something that is reflected in a lot of different pieces of research. Um, you know, for long-term, the, all the long-term outcomes that we really care about, are kids getting a high school degree? Are they going to college? Are they graduating from college? Um, what do their employment patterns look like? D grades matter a lot more than test scores. 
So what do we actually mean by non-cognitive factors or non-cognitive skills? Um, and, you know, and as was pointed out in the piece that we just listened to, non-cognitive factors are, is a term that nobody likes. We've had many, many debates about what a horrible, horrible term this is. Um, we agree, but we sort of feel like we're stuck with it. We can blame Jake Heckman, and clearly he doesn't like that term either. Um, because, you know, basically when you say non-cognitive, it means anything that is not cognitive, which is actually even more ridiculous because many of the things that we consider to be non-cognitive are actually very clearly dependent on cognitive factors. So it's not even non like there's the cognitive factors of non-cognitive. It really makes absolutely no sense. So, um, so we started out, we were sort of like, okay, so what do we mean by this? Um, so we said, okay, it's the stuff, or as um, Jim Heckman referred to as the dark matter. Um, so it's like skills, behavior, strategies, beliefs, attitudes um, that aren't content knowledge or core academic skills, but that actually matter for school success. So we're trying to think about, so again, this is probably not so great, right? Because we're saying, well, it's not academic skills, not um, content knowledge. So, um, so anyway, so the Rakes Foundation and um, the Lunar Foundation kind of came to us and they sort of said, um, hey, can you guys actually start to make sense of all this stuff that's out there? And do a literature review, look at the evidence, and try to make some sense out of it. And, um, and at that point in time, we were kind of, we were very, very naive, because we had sort of been thinking a lot about all this non-cognitive world, but we really hadn't delved deeply into it. So we said, sure, okay, yeah, that sounds like a great project to do. Um, and, you know, and we sort of started thinking about it and looking at all the different types of work and you can kind of know because if we're actually having to look at neuroscience and psychology and economics and education and after school, there's a lot out there. And there's a lot of words, right? There's grit, there's um, persistence, there's conscientiousness, there's open-mindedness, there's innovation, there's cooperation, there's all these different terms and we are out there trying to make sense out of all these different pieces. Um, and so this, was, this turned out to be quite a big task. Um, although the one thing that everybody did seem to agree um, is just that this stuff is important. This matters, right? So, um, so what we're trying to do is how do we actually make sense out of all this out there and do it in a way that actually has implications for practice? Because even though people agree that this stuff matters, more than that, we actually want to know what can we learn from all this work that's being done out there that can actually make kids be more successful. So, um, so we put together a lit review. It was supposed to be a three-month project. I think it turned into at least a year and a half, maybe two. Um, and we took all of those different pieces and came up with five categories of non-cognitive factors. Um, we started off with academic behavior. So this is all those things that make, um, make, make it for a good student. Are you coming to class? Do you turn in your homework? Um, and then we're thinking about academic perseverance. And these are the things that Paul Tuff referred to as being really important. Um, Self-regulation, um, being able to resist temptation, all these different things that mean that kids are sticking with a task despite distractions or obstacles. Um, and then we've got academic mindset. So, how do you actually feel about academic work? What are your beliefs and attitudes around this? Um, and then there's learning strategies. So what are your strategies for engaging in the cognitive aspects of, it, of, of um, academic work? So, how, so what are your strategies for remembering, for thinking about things, for memorizing different um, things? Um, and finally, social skills. So what kind of um, interpersonal um, um, characteristics and what sort of behaviors do you have that actually facilitate interactions and relationships with other people. And we thought about how are all these related to grades. So, um, so in this project we took five big questions. Um, first off, what is it and does it matter? I mean this seems like such a really simple thing, um, but it turned out this was, took us a lot, this took most of our time to actually figure this out because actually knowing what it is turns out to be hard because a lot of people have been working on, on this, um, this area, but they really haven't been talking to each other. And so really making sense of it is a lot more complicated than we had originally anticipated. Um, secondly, you know, can we change it? This is pretty fundamental. Is it malleable? Is this something that, is it a fixed trait within us 
or is it something that will actually um, that we can actually do something about? So even though something may matter for academic outcomes, um, we may not be able to change it. So um, the example I always like to say is like height tends to be related um, to your earnings potential. This is really bad for me being five feet tall. Um, so there's not really a whole lot, even though I know this and I know it matters, there's not a whole lot I can do with this. Maybe wear heels a little bit more, but you know, I'm kind of stuck. Um, so um, the other question is, you know, can we actually change this in the classroom? You know, because we are really interested in schools and so, you know, maybe this is something that's malleable, but it's not really the type of thing that can happen in a school setting. Um, next, you know, do we actually know how to change it? Are there strategies for which there is strong evidence that they work? Um, and finally, um, we want to know, does this actually matter for, um, for achievement gaps? So we know that there's a gap between how boys and girls perform. We know that there's um, achievement gaps um, among racial and ethnic groups. But is the reason for this a gap in non-cognitive skills, or is it something else? So we began um, by basing this all on academic performance. So how are kids performing in their classes? Um, and then we looked at um, academic behaviors. Academic behaviors are the most proximal piece of this. So everything about this is expressed through the behaviors that kids have. Um, the next piece is academic perseverance. And so this is something that people are talking about a great deal. And this is where um, all of our questions really come into play. Because, you know, what, why are you actually, when, um, so, um, so perseverance is expressed through behaviors. Are kids actually sticking with this? And it turns out that this is something that's actually pretty hard to change. I mean, how, because um, we don't actually observe um, whether or not someone is gritty um, directly, it, you actually observe it through the types of behaviors that they have. And figuring out what would strategies for changing this look like is also difficult because um, if you want kids to get better at the marshmallow test, I'm not exactly what you sure, you, what, sure what you would do with that unless you want to have them do that same test over and over again. That's probably not going to actually approve their ability to resist temptation. Um, so what do you do about um, actually making kids be able to stick with a task? Um, we, we think a lot about academic mindsets as being a way, that, a way of actually helping kids um, to stick with different tasks. Um, so we identified four different big mindsets. Um, first, um, do kids actually believe that they can do it? Do they have a sense of self-efficacy? Um, it's kids who actually believe that they can do something are more likely to actually continue working on it. Um, next, do they actually have a growth mindset? So do they think if they work on this, that they'll actually get better at it? Because you know, at first, something might be hard, but over the long term, um, it should get easier and their skills should actually improve. Um, next, we also think a lot about a sense of belonging. So do kids actually feel like they belong in the academic environment. Are they supported in their learning? Um, and then, and then um, finally, I'm always bad at this, my last one. Um, and then the last one is, I'm totally blanking now. <laughs> Not learning strikes, I'm sorry, this is my fourth mindset. This is, I always talk about this, I always have this blank on the last um, mindset. It's actually about having a sense of relevance. Does this is actually have value to you? Um, are you actually engaged in a task that matters? Um, kids who actually think that what they're working on will, um, has, has value are more likely to stick with it. Um, so the piece after that is, do kids actually have strategies? If you actually have a strategy for engaging in a particular task, you're much more likely to stay, to continue working on it. Um, and finally, social skills. So social skills are sort of a tough one because um, they sort of are so intertwined with the other pieces and so there's a lot less evidence on this one. Um, although there is really strong evidence that have uh, low levels of social skills um, have a negative impact on kids' academic performance. Um, so we always think about this in terms of the context. So to what extent are these all about the context that kids are in? And are these things that actually can be transferred from one context to another? 
Um, and then again, all of this is embedded within a larger so socio-cultural context. Okay, so um, just to kind of go through this, some of the key points here are, um, okay, the fact that um, academic behaviors are the ones that have the most immediate effect on um, kids' outcomes. Um, there's little evidence that actually working directly on grit is actually going to matter, but um, thinking hard about um, working on kids' mindsets um, and their learning strategies can actually potentially have an impact. Uh, next, while some kids are more likely to persist in tasks, um, all students are actually more likely to if they're actually in a classroom context that is supportive of them being able to do these things. Um, and finally, um, it's what kids are actually working on is tremendously important. You can't actually have kids be, uh, be improving their learning strategies unless they're actually doing work that requires them to use um, those strategies. Okay, so there's a lot of different um, strategies that there's some evidence that they actually work. So um, we, we are kind of feeling that um, it's hard to know how we actually go about improving them, but there's a lot of different things that we do no matter. Um, having clear learning goals, things like having strong relationships, um, scaffolding, all of these things do matter. And then finally, this is where, um, this is kind of where all the implications come in and what the challenges are with this work. Because people have been working on this for a long time, um, but because people have been working in independent silos, there's a lot here that is still really unknown. Um, so one of the big questions is, to what extent are the non-cognitive factors actually transferable about s across settings and context? So I may, be a I may have good strategies, um, and I may have um, developed certain mindsets in my math class, but are these actually going to help me in my English class? If I learn how to do this in eighth grade, am I going to know how to do this when I'm in high school? This is something that we actually don't know yet. Um, and this also becomes really important for, um, for work in after school. If we actually learn how to, if kids learn how to do something in after school, is, are these lessons that they will go into the next day in school and be able to apply just as well? Um, and to what extent are, are all of these different non-cognitive factors um, embedded within the student, or are they really about building the right sorts of context that, that help kids be better learners? And then finally, um, this is, is this whole idea of readiness. You know, if all these different things are really just a product of what's going on in the school, um, how do we actually think about college readiness? How do we actually think about making kids be successful in the long run? And are these things that we really can be teaching kids um, how to be successful? Okay, thank you.